Hi, this is Jeff Geisinger, and welcome to the third tutorial in the ArcSim simulation game tutorial series. In the first tutorial, we learned how to set up a simple energy model and run a simulation by assigning some user settings and running the Energy Plus component in the student game dashboard and looking at our results. In the last tutorial, we looked at a more in-depth view of the components that make up the zone settings, material definitions, and parametric geometry for the grasshopper definition that, that defines the simulation game. That was called the instructor model settings. And so now we'll take a closer look at the instructor results settings. So we'll be taking a look at how we actually input the Energy Plus results into these grasshopper components in order to properly organize the results according to the different end uses like lighting, equipment, cooling and heating, and make the unit conversions into carbon, and also record and visualize our results. So we'll take a look at how that is set up in this definition so that the instructor has a better understanding of the way that the results end of the file works. I'm using a geometry that I set up in the previous tutorial, made a couple of changes, and I will make one change to the model, to the inputs by, let's say, assigning dimming so that I have some basis of comparison. So I'll go ahead and run a second model, just so we have some, some kind of before and after data that we can look at. So you see that the results come in, and you see that there is a, a big improvement in terms of the lighting energy because we have dimming turned on. And also the cooling went down a slight bit because the internal gains associated with lighting went down. And so how does this actually, how do we, how do, how does this actually happen? How do we bring this into Grasshopper and then visualize it in the Rhino space? So we'll first look at the instructor results setting, the one on the left, the component on the left, which is the load e site EUI results. As we saw before in the previous tutorial, this is a clustered set of components that combines model inputs and it pulls output results from that data according to the different end uses, such as lighting, equipment, gas, heating, electric heating, and cooling, and it sends that further down in the definition in order to get greenhouse gas intensity results from that. And so I'll select this cluster and you'll see that it is connected before I, I enter the, the cluster component. You'll see that it's all connected to this model output of the Run Energy Plus component, which is an ArcSim component that's located here under Thermal Model. And so I'll make this a little bit bigger so you'll see that this, this model output is really just, it's the output of, the, of your current simulation that you're running. And so everything that comes out of this model will, you will utilize in order to take the results and interpret those results in a way that gives us carbon information, and then we can then visualize those results. So you see that all of those, uh, the model is, is input into four different categories, and I'll double click here. And each of those model outputs is set into an input that's called, into a component that is called the load results file component. And if I go to analysis in ArcSim, in the ArcSim tab, and I click on load results file, you see this is the component that we're using. In each case, I've renamed the input according to the specific end use that I'm, I'm focusing on for that results component. By default, it's model. And that helps to remember that you, you take, click the, and connect the, the model output from the Energy Plus component into each of these different inputs in the cluster. And so it's basically model to model. So in this case, I renamed the model input Zone Electric Lights Energy so that I would remember um, and that I would see that that would be the input in a, my cluster component. In order to set that, we actually, you can click on the outputs for the, the settings for the, the zone output results component, and you'll see that there's a list of outputs that corresponds with the outputs that you have defined in the run energy plus simulation component. If you remember, if I go back to that component once again, I will click here on settings, and you see here for outputs, you check all the outputs that you want for the model. and we encourage the students not to touch any of these for the simulation team. These should be fixed. But for the instructor, you know that the, these are the different outputs that we need in, um, in order to visualize the different results for in the two different graphs that we have 
for the simulation game in Rhino. So we have the carbon intensity graph, which is broken down into four different end uses. And we have the energy balance graph, which uses things like zone infiltration, heat gain, and so forth. So I'll go back to that cluster. And so each of these load results components has one box checked for each end use that we want. So we'll be looking at zone lights electric energy for this one. And you see it's connected to an output according that, that it's labeled lighting. And there's one for electric energy. And if I click on this, you'll see that this is labeled, or this has checked zone electric equ equipment electric energy. The next would be total ideal heating energy. You'll see that's checked. And then the last is ideal loads total cooling energy, which is checked here. And you'll notice for all of them, I do not have normalized by floor area. This is important. We'll normalize in Grasshopper after in some of the subsequent steps. And then you'll see for all of these, I have to have a toggle connected to the toggle input. And it's, uh, you'll see here that there's a toggle input. And so this has to be set to true in order for it to actually give me results. If I set it to false, it will return nothing. But once I set it back to true, it will actually allow it to be a kind of gate that opens in order to take the model input and get the data just for the lights, the lights, electric energy, and then have that output here in results. And I have each of these connected to a panel. And each of these panels contains a list or a tree of data the tree contains a list for each zone in your model. Because I'm, I made a building that's four stories, I have four zones. Excuse me, I should have five, actually five zones because I have a building that's five stories. The first list in the tree, or the branch in the tree is zero, which is still um, counts as a, a number, a quantity in, in, that, in that tree. So you'll see that I have the same list for each of the different end uses, lighting, equipment, heating, and cooling. So you'll see that the results that we get for the different en energy end uses from Energy Plus are in joules. And you see that there are 12 values in each list that corresponds to each month of the year. So we have monthly results. And we need to convert this to a number that is more typically used for energy for energy consumption in buildings, which would be kilowatt hours. And that would also reduce these numbers to more manageable figures. And so in order to convert to kilowatt hours, we need to take each of these trees and pass it through a, a conversion in order to get kilowatt hours from joules. And so we use here a an expression designer and we just write an expression. So we want to take the number of the input and divide that by 3,600,000, which is the conversion between joules and kilowatt hours. And we want that to round that number to two decimal places. And so we do that for each tree. And so we essentially do that for each end use, lighting, equipment, heating, and cooling. And you see that our results are still, we still have our monthly results here. And we need to take that to the next step of applying efficiencies. So we have our monthly results. We have lighting and electricity, which are essentially the, the amount of lighting and, electric, and, and equipment that that a building uses is, it doesn't need to have any efficiency applied to it, but the heating and cooling do need to have efficiencies applied to it that are associated with the type of equipment that we're using. We assign in the energy, in the simulation game, a few different types of heating and cooling. Now, if I go back to the canvas, So in the system settings, we have our, in our pull down menu, we have three different choices for heating and cooling. And each of those choices actually has a different thermal efficiency and a, di a different fuel source associated with them. So if you double click on the value list, you'll see that if I expand this, you'll see that uh, on the left, we have the name of the different system choices. And on the right, we have a combination of numbers. And I use that combination of numbers and later in, in the grasshopper definition to kind of pull it apart and inform the type of efficiency for heating and cooling and also the fuel use. And so you'll see that here for boiler heating and direct expansion AC, the, there is a point, a value of 0.8, which corresponds to the heating efficiency. There's the following comma, comma separated value of 3.1, which is the cooling efficiency. And then there's a number one, which tells it that it's using natural gas 
and electricity, natural gas for heating and electricity for cooling. You'll see that there's also these different combinations for baseboard heating and direct AC cooling. And with a num the number at the end also tells it that this is electricity for both. And I'll explain this a little bit later. And then the ground source heat pump. Heating and cooling is electricity for both, but with different types of efficiency values and different fuel source because of the um, ground source. So I'll cancel that and I'll go back to the cluster component here. And you'll see that my efficiency type, which is a, th that combination of numbers, so whatever the student chooses as the efficient, the heating and, and cooling system, there will be this efficiency type input that goes into this text split and it splits the numbers up into those three different values. So as I mentioned before, there's the heating factor which is for the, the baseline boiler heating is 0.8. There's a cooling factor, which as I'd mentioned is 3.1 for the direct expansion AC. And then there's a, there's a value, there's that number, that suffix at the end, that is one for gas heating and electric cooling, and two is for both, of elect, both electric, and three would be, although it's not included here, three would be for both electric as well, what, but with the, the ground source heat pump. And so you'll see that this, gate value passes through this gate, basically it's, an e it's checking to see if that number is equal to one. And so if it's equal to one, that means it's gas heating, but if it's two or three, like in the baseboard, baseboard heating and direct AC cooling or ground source heat pump heating and cooling, which is both electricity, and these numbers will be greater than one, that will not pass the gate. And so that will, that will get sent down to, into the not equal sign. And so th that, that is essentially dispatching those values. So it lets me know if I have either gas heating and electric cooling, or if I have electric heating and electric cooling. And this might sound a little bit confusing, but as we change the values for the different HVAC systems, and you see these heating factors and cooling factors change, and where they end up in this definition, it'll start to make sense. So this properly assigns the gas heating thermal efficiency for this baseline boiler heating and direct AC cooling and it, it, it will ignore the electric heating because there is no electric heating because it knows that it has a, a suffix value of one, so it knows that it's the, the heating is associated with natural gas. And the electric cooling, it, it knows that it, the, the coefficient of performance is 3.1, which I'd indicated earlier. It takes the, the numbers, the, the energy numbers from heating and cooling. You see here that those monthly numbers that are converted to kilowatt hours. It takes them through these efficiency factors according to the right fuel source, and it then takes it to the next step, which is summing up all the months and normalizing by meter squared. The lighting energy, it bypasses the efficiencies. The lighting energy has no efficiencies, and same with equipment. That's all just pure electricity. It's going through here, and it is going to be normalized by the area of the building. And that area is right here. It's the floor area. This floor area is indicated here in a panel, and then it's actually out, it's it's extending outside of the component as uh, outside of the cluster as this cluster input demonstrates, and this goes back to that initial floor area that is connected to our model. So it's this area is directly linked to the area of the model, and it will change with the model any change to the model. These different end use energy consumption numbers are normalized or divided by the square meters of the building, and so that happens to the lighting, the equipment. This also happens to the heating and cooling after it passes through its thermal efficiencies. So gas heating is going to be divided by 0.8, and then passing through here, it's going to be added up and then normalized. So as, just as a reminder, all of these monthly values here, they get flattened, and they get added up into one annual number. And so this happens for all of the different end uses. And you see that those final numbers are the annual lighting site energy use intensity, the annual equipment site energy use intensity, and so forth. And these numbers are, are stored here in these containers, and those are then sent to the visualization. And so we'll continue down here, and you see here, then I sum them up, and we get our total energy use intensity, which is 83. This is the total energy use, the kilowatt hours per meter squared for the building for the year. So I'll close back that, I'll close out that, and I'll say no, no to save changes. Okay, so now we have our site energy use intensity results, but you'll remember that the end use graph that we have for the, for the simulation game in the Rhino space is actually kilograms 
of carbon dioxide equivalent over meter squared, so or in other words, greenhouse gas emissions or carbon intensity. And so when, in order to get carbon intensity numbers, we need to actually make a conversion between energy, which is kilowatt hours per meter squared, to carbon intensity, which is kg CO2e per meter squared. And so that's what this cluster component does. So you see here that the end use outputs from the energy use intensity, intensity results go into the end use inputs for the carbon intensity conversion, and then we get our carbon intensity results as outputs in this cluster. And so to see how that's set up, I double click on the cluster and I'll enlarge the canvas. So you see that there are these different EUI inputs and they go into these multiplication, these different multiplication components. They're basically just multiplication components that multiply the energy use intensity input by a conversion factor that takes kilowatt hours to kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. And those conversion factors for different fuel sources are located as a kind of national average in one of ASHRAE's documents, 189.1. And you'll see these conversion factors that take you from the energy use of kilowatt hours to kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. So you'll see that the grid electricity is 0.758 and then natural gas is 0.232. And so I use that as the second factor to multiply each energy use intensity by for lighting, equipment, gas heating, and electric heating, and electric cooling. Remember, we have to do it to heating at two different instances because we have heating in some cases by gas and in some cases by electricity, so two different fuel sources. And we use our, our dispatching from before takes care of preventing any kind of double counting for gas and electric heating. You can only have one value. So you see here, right now I'm only taking into account gas heating because I have the boiler option selected. And you'll see that the first result it has a number and the second is zero, which is correct. So we take the results of the multiplication, which is basically the energy use intensity times the conversion factor. That gives us our, directly our value for kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per meter squared. You see here I have them set through mass addition components. That's actually not necessary. We already have these added up as annual values. I think these were a, a holdover from when these, these components were used with inputs that were monthly. So this is no harm. It's just adding them up, adding up a single number, which is not making any difference to those numbers. So that's okay. And so you'll see that we have our kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per meter squared for each end use, and then we send that to these containers, which then get sent to the graphing and recording component. So you'll see each of these end uses get sent to that component. And I also want to know the total because I want to write down the total on top of that bar graph. So if I close out of this, you'll remember that the total for each iteration's carbon intensity is written on top of each graph. The next step is then to, how do we know how to record each result? To so basically make sure that this graph indicates, it remembers every iteration. So we have to do that by using recording tools. And so I will close this. I'll expand the canvas a little bit. And so for each iteration, we'll want to use what's called a um, recording component, a data recorder. And what this data recorder does is that it, it basically, for every um, time that the button is pressed for to run a simulation, the model results and the conversions will get sent through these components and they'll be recorded in this, these data recorders. Then we can utilize that recorded data to visualize it in an incremental graph. And so the way that this works is that I have this cluster component here um, under the record carbon, uh, under record results in the record carbon group. I have a cluster component that takes the the true true false message uh, for whenever the run simulation button is pressed. Whenever the button is is pressed, it, it will it will indicate true. Whenever the button is not pressed, so normally if you're just in your definition in your grasshopper file and you're not pressing the button, it's it's automatically false. So whenever it's true, this dispatch component will send a true message to these secondary dispatch components, which will basically tell these components to send the results for the model results for lighting, for equipment, for heating, and for cooling out. And 
it will send that data out to these data recorder components and these record data over time and so whenever these uh, record buttons are indicated as red they're going to be recording and they're going to be adding or recording incrementally for lighting equipment heating and cooling they'll be sent to these flip matrix components which will uh, structure the data in the right way for them to be compiled into these into this list structure this tree structure which you'll see here it divides up the data into lighting equipment heating and cooling for the first iteration and then when we pre press the button the second time you'll remember that we had dimming on and so we saw the lighting decrease and so we had lighting equipment heating and cooling again for the second iteration except you'll see that the lighting it records the improvement in lighting energy so the lighting energy went down by 13 point by 13 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent um, per meter squared and you'll remember if i go to the the results in rhino you'll see that these lists correspond to the actual graph that we're getting in the rhino space so you'll see that the the 16 15 1 and 43 for lighting equipment heating and cooling is represented here in this first list of the tree. And then the, the next one, 3, 15, 2, and 40, are the end use greenhouse ga uh, gas intensity or carbon intensities for the second iteration. And this will keep going if we, if we were to continue to run simulations by making changes. Each time that we press the button for a new iteration, it will add a, another branch to that tree. And I'll go ahead and make a change, and we'll just see how that how the changing is reflected. So I will, for example, go to ground source heat pump, the cost increases, I'll press the button and I'll run another simulation. And you'll see that the cooling energy went down quite a bit. And if I go back down to my record results, you'll see that it added a third list to the tree a third branch to this tree, and the values for the end use for lighting, equipment, heating, and cooling are represented here in these four values in the third tree branch. And we, we see that there's other data besides these end use components that comprise the, the bar chart that, that get updated. There's the total carbon intensity value on the top of the graph that keeps updating in a, in a way that's recorded for each iteration. There's the cost. There's the site energy use intensity, and there's also the iteration number. So we need to also tell the Grasshopper definition to record these, these other values, not just the end uses, but also some of these other ancillary values that we want to be reflected in the graph as well. So you see that these, these other ancillary recordings are in the Grasshopper definition above the record carbon. So there's the record energy use intensity. It gives it a unit value. It takes the the text from the total EUI that we set up as an output in the load site EUI results, if you remember, and we have that as another dispatch is basically saying that whenever the button is pressed, go ahead and record that site EUI, and it does. It records it as a list here, and those values are represented here in the site EUI row for each iteration. We also record costs the same way. We get the costs in MIT dollars that come from the cost calcs from the, that we saw in the last tutorial. So the cost output in this cluster component just goes ahead and goes straight to this record cost dispatch. And whenever the button is pressed, whenever it's true, it gets recorded. And you'll see here again, we have the list of dollar values that come in. And then we also want to have the iteration number. And we want to have a new path. This is an, and this is an, a kind of important behind the scenes structure in the grasshopper definition that's, in, that's important to know for the instructors. We first record the different iteration number. And that iteration number is actually determined by the number of button presses, of, of true button presses that, we, that we've done. So essentially the number of simulation runs that we've done is, this, is equal to the number of iterations and then that gets recorded. And so in order to do that, you'll see that we actually have a, a, a running tab of the amount of times that the button is pressed. That's, that gets set here, and you'll see that there's a data recorder that records the amount of, of times that the, buttons are, the button is pressed. It's simply just the button output is just tied into this data recorder input. And so you see by default it always begins as false, and then it, you press it and it's true, and then it's depressed automatically and it become, becomes false again. And you'll see that this, 
this list gets put into a dispatch and we're basically saying, okay, we want to just know how many times the list is true. And so you see that this dispatch will, will say how many times it's false and how many times it's true. So we, we plug in the B output of the dispatch, which basically tells you how many times it's pressed as true. And that gets sent to a what's called a list length component that just measures the le length of the list. And so you see that there's three true values. And so it says, okay, that there's three, the, the list is three items long. And that becomes the iteration number, the current iteration number. And so each time that the button is pressed, we have a, a new number for the, the length of the list. And that basically gets sent to, again, to a data recorder. So that iteration number gets sent to the, another dispatch. It basically isolates the, whenever the button is pressed, it, it, goes, it goes ahead and sends that value to this data recorder. And then that gets sent to a, a list of basically built, um, incrementally increasing iteration numbers. And so you see it's one, two, three. So every time that the button is pressed, it adds the next one. So it'll, it'll add four. And then that basically gets visualized here on under iteration number. And you'll also see that the iteration number, the current iteration number, the last iteration number gets sent to this directory name component, which is really just a, a text join. And so what this is also doing is it's creating a place to save the data associated with each simulation run. And all the Energy Plus files associated with the, the simulation gets sent to a new subfolder that we create in the project, the local project directory, in order to have a record of the, the simulation and the, and the data associated with that simulation. And so that, that gets defined by, I'll make this a little bigger, that's defined by the local directory where we want to store our files. And this is defined just by a, a simple panel, a text box. And by default, we have it here as in the C drive under a folder called simulation game. And you'll see that if I open that up in my C drive and I go to simulation game, you'll see that the simulation game definitions will, will start to, it'll create different subfolders for each iteration that we run. Every time we press the, the run simulation button, it will create a new subfolder for each iteration. So you'll see starting with iteration, we can skip iteration zero, but starting with iteration one, it's, it creates a subfolder and it gives you all of the behind the scenes energy plus files, including the output CSV and the IDF file, which defines all the inputs. And it's, that gets recorded in this subfolder and you'll see it's named tempt temp because that's what we called our project as we called the, the name of the project. It, it all gets stored here in this subfolder. If I go back and it does the same thing for each iteration. And so that simulation game, that base kind of the base parent folder is defined here by, by the instructor here in the, in this panel. And that gets sent to this text join. And then the subfolder is created. You'll see here by, by adding the iteration number to this parent directory. And you'll see that the output, if I just create a new, another panel, the output is that text join. So you see the, the, parent folder with a backslash and then the current iteration. And then that creates the folder and that's where the data is sent. And now we're also doing a few other things with the recording capabilities. We're also baking the iterations to unique layers. So in Rhino, you'll see that if I open up the layers dialog box, you'll see that for each iteration we have a layer that's created in Rhino. And you'll see that if I turn the, those layers on, it gives you the geometry for every iteration that we've created. And since we're using automatic windows, it's really just the zone geometry. Now, this is, this is useful because when students run multiple iterations and they have different geometries created in their Rhino file and they want to have a record of what previous iterations that it did without having to kind of copy tens of different iterations in their Rhino space, they can just go back to these iteration layers and see the geometry that they made. And so this is useful in kind of having a record of the actual Rhino file, the Rhino geometry that goes in. That happens here. So the iteration, the iteration number is used as a, as a, a suffix to a, a text, a text box called iteration underscore. And that creates a, automatically creates an iteration underscore 
and then the, the number of the current iteration, and then that gets sent to a C sharp component that we downloaded from a, a Grasshopper user's website that is often that has been widely used for for baking attributes in Grasshopper for objects and layers and so forth, and that's here on the Giulio Piacentino uh, website. And that, that component was taken and put into this Grasshopper file. And you'll see that whenever this is true, we send this new iteration underscore three or iteration with the current iteration number to the layers. And then we have our objects um, linked to the different geometry in our file. So we have zone geometry and then um, custom windows if we have custom windows. And it's activated by the button press. And so every time that the simulation is run, this output creates a new layer in Rhino of that current iteration. And then lastly, we're also saving the settings so that we have a record of the settings that the, student use, the students use for every iteration that they create, which is useful. And you know, as the students accumulate a high number of iterations, this way we have a record of the different settings that they use, not just the geometry, but also the settings. And you'll see that all of the settings from these value lists are input into this panel as a list. Well, it's a little bit confusing. You know, some some of the some of these the data that gets recorded is is easily understandable. Like the roof underscore r twenty, roof uh, wall underscore r thirteen. It's these are the, these. This is easy to know what settings they chose. And you, there are a few numbers that are also just um, a little bit more confusing. Like the window to wall ratio. The sixty three is actually a percentage that a scale a scale factor that is used to create. Let's say a forty percent. Um, window to wall ratio. You'll remember that if we click on the value list, it's really the values on the right that get sent to the data upstream. It's useful to know what uh, what these numbers mean. And so the the next one would be, you know, we have zero and point nine, and that refers to if I go back up here, the shading length, and then point nine was the fact that the occupancy sensor was on. Remember that the, these these outputs have to do with uh, factors that are applied to lighting power density and so forth, and so they're not as um, they need to be numbers. They, they're not they're not just the, the the text on the left. Now this could be simplified perhaps, or this could be another step could be added in order to translate these numbers back to the text. But um, for simplicity purposes, we just kept them as the output numbers uh, that come out of the value list, and the instructor can just have a, a key knowing that, okay, 3.1, th these efficiency factors refer to the ground source heat pump that we use, that either it has the, the number three on on the right, and that refers to the ground source heat pump. If it was a number one on the right, we know that it refers to the gas boiler and so forth. So all these numbers are, are kind of code for the different settings that we have um, established for the envelope and system settings. And these get recorded in the local project directory, if you remember, if I go to back to this folder, if I go to this look, this last iteration, you'll see that there, for every iteration, there's a text file. It, it'll be settings and then the number of the iteration. And if I double click on it, you basically get the a text file of that list of different settings. So the roof, the wall, the glazing, and then the different code for the window to wall ratio, the shading depth, the occupancy sensor, lighting power density, and so forth. And that gets recorded through this C sharp a C sharp component that is well I won't go into the definition of that C sharp component it's coded in order to write a text file based on this information in your local project directory in, in the the local directory where each iteration is being saved. So the next step is the visualization. So how we actually visualize these two graphs? We have the carbon intensity graph where we went over how that how the data actually comes into in into play and how it gets recorded and and then the the different ancillary data components how those actually become part of the graph but we we didn't cover how we actually make the graph and how we actually make this this carbon intensity graph and how we make the energy balance graph and so th those need to be visualized and sent in, back into rhino and so i'll go back to the grasshopper definition and you'll see that those steps for visualizing are located here in the final kind of group in the instructor results um, settings row. So that's broken up into carbon intensity results and energy balance results for the two different graphs that we have, for these two different graphs here, the carbon and the 
energy balance. So without going into too much detail for these two visualization components, you'll see that each one is set up by a number of, of clustered components. The carb looking at the carbon intensity results first. So let's look first at the graph generator. And this is a clustered component that takes the data from the recorded results. So all this, this tree of different branches, each branch giving you four stacked bar graph of four different end use results that gets sent into data. And we have some other inputs for the graph settings, but I'll just go into this component. And it's, it's quite big, but what's important to note is that this data goes into, the, into this grapher. The data gets structured, it gets flipped in order to be visualized in a way that can be made into a bar chart. And that gets set into, sent into this C-sharp component that is basically taking the data and making a bar chart out of it. And it has a set point and it has a scale and spacing and, and a legend. But the chart is actually a C-sharp C -sharp script set up by Mano Saratsis in the MIT Design uh, Sustainable Design Lab. And what this component does is that it, it takes the data and it creates a vertical stacked bar chart for each iteration, for each, for each end use. And it gives you different colors for each end use. And it has outputs that can go um, further, further in the definition and or in to different preview components that will actually preview that geometry or that the results graph in Rhino. And what this cluster component also contains is that it, it, it locates the different tags for the results. Like we saw the, the total carbon intensity, which gets put on top of the bar graph, the individual values for the for each end use is placed in the middle of each component of the bar chart, and then there's MIT dollars and kilowatt hours and so forth that are kind of legends as well as specific values for each iteration that's below the bar chart. And so all that is happening here in the in the locate tags. So it's really just taking the data. It's finding, it's taking the data and finding the size of this bar chart, and it's saying, okay, I'm going to put the data for tags on top of it. I'm going to put a carbon dioxide legend on the on the left. I'm going to add these different um, legends for for dollars and so forth to below the the bar chart. All that is happening here. It's all a kind of a result of where w the geometry that's created for this bar chart. It 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 identifies the the geometry of of the bar chart and it puts the tags each individual tag in its proper location. And I will close out of that. And so that's the graph generator for the carbon intensity. And the settings, in order to get the right colors and so forth, and the text size and the location, that's set up here in the graph settings. And while I'm in the cluster, it dis the actual graph temporarily hides. But you'll see that there's settings for scale. There is line and text colors that can be customized. There are legends for the different uh, um, end use values, and as well as carbon intensity and ancillary values of cost, site EUI, and the iteration number. So I'll get, I'll close out of that. And the next visualization component is the energy balance results. And whereas the carbon intensity builds incrementally for every iteration, the energy balance results is updated for every new iteration that the students create. And so this is constantly updating. The intent for this graph is for students to see some of the impacts of different components of heat gain and heat loss to understand where they can make improvements in their current model. For example, you'll see that if I zoom in here on the legend, the heat gains from windows is quite large, 123.2 kilowatts per square meter. And that is this value here, the third value from the top. I know that these colors are, are quite subtle. It's a, a little bit hard to make a connection between the legend and the graph. But you'll see that the major player for heat gains is, is, is this third component of the energy balance chart, third from the top, which is the heat gains through windows. And that is quite high throughout the graph. And in order to make an energy balance, in order to maintain a comfortable temperature inside, the energy model has to take into account some way to get rid of that heat. And you'll see that, that that's mainly done through sensible cooling. And that is this value here, the, the fourth value from 
the bottom zone sensible cooling, which is you'll see it needs to have an it, it needs to maintain the temperature, it needs to reject that heat, and the value for zone sensible cooling for the project for this current iteration is 163.3 kilowatt hours per square meter, and you'll see that all of these lower values, the, the heat losses are negative because they're rejecting heat, they're negative, whereas the heat gains are positive. And so this is kind of like a mirrored graph. The, the energy balance of the project has to be equal. In order to visualize this, we basically take our results from the model. You'll see that these are all connected to the model output of energy plus, and they're separated into gains and losses. So you'll see here that there are gains for heating, people, lighting, equipment, windows, walls and roof, and infiltration. And then there are losses associated with cooling, windows, walls and roof, and infiltration. They're all normalized. You'll see here that they're tied to the meter squared of the project. And if I zoom in, you'll see, for example, for the positive values, we saw that we saw this model um, load results file component before when we were looking at the carbon intensity or when we were looking at the um, taking the energy use intensity results and then converting them to carbon intensity. And in this case, we have to actually create, we have to have a model results, a load results file component for each component of heating of, excuse me, for each, each component of gains. And then we have to have another set of values for ever, all the negative ones for each component of the losses. And so you'll see here, by double clicking on that load results, uh, each, each load results component has one item checked. So in this case, we're looking at heating, zone sensible heating, and so we have the zone ideal loads total heating energy checked. When we look at the heat gains from people inside the space, I'll double click on that, and you'll see there's just one box checked. It's the zone people total, total heating energy. And each of those outputs is restructured in order to have it visualized in the, in the right way for our graph and they're added up. We want to have a monthly graph, monthly results for the entire project. And so if you have multiple zones like this five story building, we, we want to make sure that we can add all those up and just have one monthly set of data for the whole building. And that data is set up in joules for every component of the heat gains. And then they're also for, for the heat losses in the other component. And we normalize those values by, this is connected again to the floor area of the project. And those are all normalized here. And then we're, we send those out. Those are sent out and then they're sent to a data tree component where we take the jewels and we combine those results and we convert them from jewels into, into kilowatt hours and we round them. And those are sent to a graph generator that takes the positive values that we just looked at and takes the losses, the negative values. And again, using scale and spacing, we'll double click on that. The data, the, the positive and negative values are sent to this, a very similar chart that is another C-sharp script. And that gives us the individual geometry outputs for the, for the graph. And, the location points and where the legends need to go and so forth. And then we also put in a, a text legend for the heat gains and losses that you remember. And all of those are output into these preview geometry, these preview components that create this monthly bar chart. And you'll see here that the, the legend for the specific energy balance chart also includes not just the name of the different components, but also conveniently it, it includes a, a kind of total, a total for each. So it gives you the yearly, well, even though this is a monthly graph, it gives you the yearly total for the different components. So we can understand that yes, the zone sensible cooling is one of the biggest players for the whole year for the energy balance. And you'll see that there's a balance check where we look at the sum of all the positive values and the sum of all negative values. You'll remember that this is kind of like a mirrored chart. They're kind of equal. They should be equal. The, the gain should be equal to the losses. And perhaps because of, because of rounding um, or that there needs to be, there's a, a slight, uh, slight 
difference in the negative values. The negative values are a tiny bit lower than the positive values, but the overall shape of the graph is doing what we want. It it's balancing the the gains and the losses, and it tells us the story of the the role that each individual source of heat gains or source of heat losses is 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 doing in the project, and it, and it helps the student identify where they can make improvements. And so these just these two numbers just need to be close. So lastly, the same for both the energy balance and for the carbon, we have our results that get sent to these text tags and these preview components. And you'll see that the same thing is happening for the carbon intensity results, although the, these all of these outputs are, are connected to the these preview tags in the student dashboard. And what these tags are, what these previews and tags are, is that it's basically they're the, the last component at the end of the, the data stream, at the end of the grasshopper definition, that actually represents the preview of the, the different text tags in each graph. And so if I, in grasshopper, if I say only draw preview geometry for selected objects to make it a little bit easier to see, so I'll select one of these tags and I'll go ahead and click this. You'll see that that this is the these are the sets of tags for the individual values of the gains and losses within the energy balance graph. And if I go to if I bring the preview geometry back and if I go to the carbon results graphs and I go back up to in the grasshopper definition to the these preview tags for that graph. And if I say only draw preview geometry for selected objects, you'll see that, okay, so the bar values, and I go ahead and only preview those, these are the bar values for the carbon results. There's the cost tags, the, the y-axis values, the carbon legend, and so forth. And so all these tags are, or they're, they're final previews for all of these different text items in the final graph results. And then also we have these mesh, these kind of mesh previews. So if I click on the bars and then only preview the selected geometry, you'll see that, okay, that the, this, this final container is like, it's like the final preview for these bar graphs, for the end use bar graphs, and as, as well as the legend symbol and then the horizontal lines. So all these together make up the graph. And the reason why the energy, the energy balance results are in the, the instructor, in the instructor results area is because they actually don't need to be baked. They're just showing. They're just there for reference for the student to understand the uh, the effects of their different building components on the heat gains and heat losses. But the reason why the carbon results previews are located in the student dashboard is because at the end of the game, the students need to select all of these previews and then bake them into their file. That's why the students can can select there. It's in the dashboard. It's it's there for them to select, and then they can select all of those components and then bake them. And that brings all of these chart items into the Rhino space, and it allows them to have a record of all of the results in graph form. Whereas the the layers, as we remember, the the geometry is stored in the layers within the Rhino file, and the all of the behind the scenes. Energy Plus files, output files, and the settings files are located in simulation game for each iteration in these subfolders. So that about wraps up the explanation of the instructor results settings for the simulation game. So this should clarify how the simulation game file works in, in conjunction with the Rhino geometry making, um, some Grasshopper automated parametric window creation and, and other functions, as well as the energy plus structure for creating an energy simulation and organizing the results. It should also be noted that the data recorders could also be reset in order if you're practicing with the game and you need to just clear out the data in order to have a clean slate and start over, you can always hit X on all of these different recording elements the data recording components in order to clear the data for the whole grasshopper component and start fresh. You see, I, I've just baked the, I've already baked all of these 
data outputs and so those are still in, in the Rhino file, but the, the Grasshopper previews and all the data associated with the model are cleared. And so there's, that's just an area to be careful with when clearing recorded data, but it is useful if you need to run some tests and start over, you can always hit X on all these. So this wraps up the simulation game and happy playing. And remember to consult the previous two tutorials in order to have a comprehensive sense of how the simulation game works in ArcSim.